will not discover anything that will be after him. It's an interesting way to conclude this first section of chapter 7. And it's interesting that as you get into the rest of this chapter, Solomon makes some statements in verses 23 and 24. He says, I have examined all this by wisdom. I said, I am determined to comprehend this. But it is too far for me. It is beyond my grasp. Verse 24, whatever has happened is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover? In other words, it's far deeper than anyone can fathom. He's going to move into this contemplation that there are some things that are difficult for us to understand. And this is nothing new. He's done this before, but it really has gotten me to think. Especially coming into the end section in chapter 7. Because I started to realize that Scripture really it challenges us to think counterintuitively. There are a lot of things that God reveals to us that we have to work our minds around. They don't come easy for us, right? And so often we find in Scripture that some of the most precious truths are counterintuitive to our fallen human nature. In other words, our tendency is, is that we have these frameworks of thinking and patterns of thought and paradigms that we think of that, that as an earthbound creature, as someone who is under the sun, and we keep trying to take Scripture and make it fit our paradigms rather than readjust our way of thinking to the way that God thinks or the way that God sees things or how He defines things. So often we, we put Scripture under our scrutiny rather than putting ourselves under Scripture scrutiny. We keep trying to make God fit into our boxes. And what I found, find over and over, especially when I come to this section in chapter 7, is that there needs to be confrontation. And not us confronting God or us confronting His Word. His Word confronting us. I constantly need to be challenged in the way that I think about life and reality and God. And I realized that there has to be, for me, a constant transformation. And Paul calls for this in Romans 12, right? That we need to be transformed by what? By the renewing of our minds. Think differently. We need to reorganize things in our lives. We need to alter our minds and we need to recategorize things. When we think about God and reality. Especially when it comes to the issue of suffering. So I, I'm, I'm taking this interesting journey. I am studying through Ecclesiastes and preaching through it, and I'm studying through Philippians and teaching through Philippians at the same time. These are just two books that I'm working through at this time of my life. And it is an interesting journey for me. And there are some points in when there is connection. But I started thinking about this in relation to suffering, and Paul says in Philippians 1.29, he says something that is so startling to us about suffering. It isn't merely just inevitable, right? I mean, we understand. We live in a fallen world that suffering is inevitable in our life. But then it's also necessary. Now, that's sort of a step that's hard for us to take sometimes. That suffering is necessary in our life. But Paul takes it further than that. He says that suffering is actually a manifestation of God's grace. This fits none of my paradigms. This does not fit in any boxes I have constructed for myself in life. And especially when it comes to the issue of suffering. And I just highlighted for you in the yellow, this is the word charis and grace. And so what's interesting in Greek is that you can take a, a root word and you can make it a noun, a verb, an adjective, a participle, whatever you want. You can do this. But at the heart of this, this is a verb. It's passive voice. It means God does it. And at the heart of this is grace. He says that suffering, not only faith, but suffering is a grace gift from God. Therefore, I'm not to think of suffering for the sake of Christ as a curse, but rather as a gift. No, that does not work for me, God. So not only is suffering inevitable, Paul says it's also a privilege. And if we take it further, just give you a little bit deeper thought to take yourself on over this week, if he puts parallel statement, because the verb here governs both the, the 
faith in Christ and also the suffering for Christ's sake. So if the faith is an unworthy blessing from God, then what does that make suffering? If it stands on common ground as a grace gift from God, that also means that this suffering is an unworthy blessing from God. Think about that one. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's like when we come to these things, we, we have the ways in which we think, and it is earthbound, and it is under the sun, and we keep trying to take God and fit Him into our boxes, and that isn't how it works. And the more that I look to the God of Scripture, the more that I realize He is far bigger than any box I can ever construct for Him. God can't be limited to space. <laughs> And it's like the disciples with Christ in the boat, right, when he stills the storm. And they say, what manner of man is this? In other words, we have no categories to put this man in. So John uses the same expression in 1 John chapter 3 when he talks about the love. What manner of love the God our Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God. There's no love like this kind of love that we experience. There's no paradigm for this. This is something new and different for us. So this is where Solomon is going to take us in these verses to areas in our life that we need to rethink and reorder and to find ourselves molded by the truth of God. He's going to deal with the sovereignty of God. He started on this in chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, that God is sovereign over all things. In chapter 7 through 8, he talks about the inscrutable plan of God, and this is what he gets to in the second part of chapter 7, and then man's ignorance of the future, chapter 9, verse 1 through 11, 6. But he highlights this in the end of verse 14, so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. In other words, you have no idea what the next day will bring. We plan like we do, <laughs> but God, it's on the calendar. This is how my day is supposed to be. He says, no, 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 I make the calendar. I determine the seasons of your life. You, however, respond within the parameters of which I give you. Thus comes wisdom. This is how we respond. So when dealing in suffering in life, God's providence, there is a tendency to diminish the character of God. And this is important because we, when we wrestle with things that are so difficult for us, we have a tendency to sort of take it out on God and we diminish the reality of who God is. In other words, there are some who believe, well, God is a good God and therefore God is not all powerful. He can't be because if God is a good God, then bad things can't happen in the world and suffering can't happen and there can't be pain because if he's a good God, then this wouldn't happen. So therefore, he must be impotent. And as much as he is a good God and he would really want to do something about this, he just can't. But that's not the God of Scripture. God is all-powerful and He is good. Or sometimes we, we rationalize it and say, well, God just didn't know what the future was going to bring. So when we have a loved one who dies, what we think is an early death, right, at a young age, and we look at this and we say, right, it, this couldn't be, so somehow God couldn't have known this was going to happen. Therefore, he doesn't know the future. And when he gives prophecy, it's just his best educated guess. He doesn't really know. I, I find no comfort in any of that. Who wants a God who is impotent, who can't control things? And who wants a God who doesn't know what's going to happen? Because I certainly don't. Someone's got to be in control. And we see what happens when it's just us. We make a mess of everything. So Solomon is going to bring us to the closing of this section. He's going to challenge us to consider God in light of his working and one of the marks of maturity is the fact that we can look at life in perspective and that we can keep things in balance. And he's going to go back to the thoughts he had earlier in chapter 7 where he talks about the issue of having a quiet spirit, being patient, not being driven to anger, not responding in foolishness to the situations around us, not trying to make things happen, but trusting that the Lord will work out His plan. So we can find that life has a tendency to push us into extremes, and we know this in our own lives, right? We have a tendency to do this, but oftentimes that the path of wisdom is the path of balance. 
And we can do this, right? And we see these fluctuating moments of our life and we go through this kind of time and that, that kind of time. And, and the, the point is that we're not supposed to be moved this way and swayed that way, but find that fine line of truth as you walk through it all. And this is what we're all looking for. And God's wisdom enables us to do this, to, to handle the changing experiences of life. And so he's going to reflect on this, but it is cultivating this kind of calm, quiet spirit. There are so many things about how God is working we don't know or understand. There are enigmas to life. But that doesn't mean that we need to get flustered or that we need to panic. We can remain calm, stay patient. It's like sometimes in quicksand, right? And I liken sometimes problems in life like that. Is that if you're stuck in quicksand, the worst thing you can do is struggle. Because the harder you fight, the faster you sink. So what you need to do is just remain calm and take a look around you. And oftentimes God has given you that lifeline. It is right there. He promises He does this. He gives us that lifeline. We just need to stay calm, look around, grab hold of that lifeline, and hang on and let Him drag us out of it. But so often we struggle and fight and kick and scream and... And we find ourselves slipping deeper and deeper into that dark place we don't want to go. So Solomon is going to help us understand several things. And there are only three main points we look at this morning. Wisdom is better than wealth is the first one. In verses 11 and 12, the catch word is wisdom. He picks this terminology up from the earlier verses 4, 5, and 7. He talks about this. And the first thing he lays out for us is that wisdom is good as with a generous inheritance. He says in verse 11, Wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing, and it benefits those who see the sun. For wisdom provides protection just as money provides protection, but the advantage of knowledge is this, wisdom preserves the life of its owner. In other words, he, he shows that there is a similarity, but yet wisdom takes it a step further. And he talks about the issue of finances through Ecclesiastes. And so we know the pitfalls of it, but he understands the fact that there is a place for it. So he helps us to see that life is not only brief, but it's also filled with trouble. And there are those who possess wisdom and also who receive an inheritance. They do experience good. There are ways in which we are provided things in this life. But the inheritance doesn't last forever. We know this, but nonetheless, it is, a, it is an advantage in life. He at least acknowledges that fact. There is an advantage to having this, but the greater advantage comes to, to us from wisdom. But both of these are limited to this life, life under the sun. As he highlights this statement to those who see the sun, this is what we're going to find in later chapters. He uses this in a positive way as well as a way in which he acknowledges the fact that we're still limited to this earth. There are benefits to both of these things. And if you look back to earlier chapters, he talks about the reality of wisdom and how far it can go and what it's meant for. And the same with the issue of finances. But he takes us a step further in verse 12 and he says, Wisdom is like a shelter, a shade, but it's a better protective shade. So literally in Hebrew he says this, Wisdom is a shade, money is a shade, but wisdom provides a better protection than money does. Why? Because money can lose its value, but wisdom never loses its value. It's a gift from God. It's far different than money. We watch this, the world around us, right? We look at the, the economic situation that this nation is in and we realize that things can become very precarious very fast. Inheritance can come and it can go. It can slip through your fingers, right? And especially the moment that you look at your finances, according to Proverbs, the moment that you look at them, they fly away, right? It's like my boys do this. They're learning this hard lesson. They work hard at their job. They get the paycheck and they think, man, this is a really great paycheck. And then all of a sudden, car breaks down, got to pay for this, got to pay for that. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, no more paycheck. It's all gone. I said, welcome to life, son. This is how it works, right? <laughs> Just wait till you have kids. <laughs> but wisdom, he says, never loses its value. And there is a place for it. And he's talking about biblical wisdom here. He's talking about the issue of right teaching that comes from Scripture, which produces right thinking, which produces right choices, and right living. And this is what we need. And so he's going to highlight the positiveness of wisdom. 
as he walks through the rest of this book. But he takes us into verse 13 of chapter 7, and this is a time when crooked is better than straight. And he's had a series of these thoughts, right? Chapter 7, he's had a lot of things that sort of shake us up. Sorrow is better than laughter. No, I don't think so, but yeah. So now he takes us to crooked. Crooked is better than straight sometimes. And he's going to help us to understand what he means by this. But through this whole chapter, he's been considering suffering and sin. And in the latter part of this chapter, he's going to deal with the issue of man's sinfulness. So he talks about the crookedness of life, verse 13. He's going to talk about the crookedness of man in verse 29. And man is a fallen human creature, corrupted by our sin. So the, the reality of it is, as he talks about corruptedness, that it's not discussed in the same way throughout this chapter. Life is under God's providence, but he understands that there are perils and perplexities that we face in life. There are things that perplex us in life, things that we don't understand. There is prosperity, but there's also adversity. And here's what I find interesting when it comes to passages like this. When we come across these difficult times or when we notice there's injustices, like you have someone who's living a righteous life and they die young, and then you have someone who's living a wicked life and it seems like they're living to a ripe old age. How does this work, God, right? So we ask these questions. How is that fair, right? We're perplexed by this situation that we see in life and we oftentimes see this. What I find interesting is that when we are perplexed by these things and God responds to them in Scripture, what I have found that most oftentimes when God responds to them, He doesn't give us a philosophical answer. He gives us a pastoral answer. In other words, I don't want some philosophical musings when it comes to suffering. I want a plain answer. And I want it pedestrian. I want legs on it. I want to know how to deal with this right here, right now, because I'm in the midst of it, right? Right? So this is what God does. So it reminded me of some statements that were made. God's servants don't live by explanations, but by promises. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? In other words, they go on to say, explanations satisfy curiosity and make us smarter, but they don't heal. Sometimes this is our problem. We look at situations in life and it's mere curiosity, right? We want an explanation from God. We want all the ins and outs. But I have found over time that I really don't want to know all the ins and outs because I wouldn't understand them even if God explained them to me. I'm still wrestling with sovereignty of God and willing choices of man with real consequences, right? How does that work? So I know that oftentimes I look at something and I, and I ask for an explanation. I really don't want the explanation, right? Just give me a promise. And this is what God does. Because what happens is that promises actually help build our character. They make us trust in God. God says, you're going to go through this, I'm going to do this, right? So I was reminded of 1 Peter 5 on Friday night with the young people. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you in due time, in its proper season, right? Promise. So what's interesting about 1 Peter is he deals with all of these adverse things. He takes worst case scenarios. Unjust, hostile government. An unreasonable, unjust owner of a slave. An unbelieving husband who's disobedient to the word, right? He picks all the worst case scenarios and he says then at the final end of 1 Peter, he says, humble yourselves on the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you in due season. So what do I need to do? I need to trust God. And I need to cultivate a spirit of patience as I wait on Him to fulfill and work out His plan in and through my life. Yes, there may be things that we need to do. However, I need to trust God all the way through it all. So Solomon takes us and he echoes this uh, statement he's already made in chapter 1, verse 15. What is bent cannot be straightened. The basic twistedness of our experience in life then, he says, isn't fate, it's God's design. And wisdom acknowledges the fact that God is orchestrating things in life, right? We look at these bent, crooked moments in the pathway of life as we're walking this narrow road and all of a sudden there's these bends that we have in life and we wonder what in the world is going on. And sometimes we just throw it up there, well, it's just fate at work, right? No, it's God work. So literally what Solomon says to us here in verse 13, 
He gives us an imperative. Twice he gives us an imperative in these verses. And both of them it's consider, consider, or literally see. See the work of God. In light of everything that's happened, he is now turning our gaze and attention to God. He says, for who can straighten what he has bent? He's done this. Now you have to understand, he's not talking about fatalism here. Because sometimes that's sort of the impression we get sometimes when we talk about the sovereignty of God and ordained circumstances and all that, that we think that this is fatalism. No. What we are being done is we're being invited. <laughs> we are being invited to yield our life to the will of God in these moments. In other words, are we going to cooperate with God? As a good old preacher once said, learn to cooperate with the inevitable. <laughs> How many times God says, yeah, you're going this way, right? I mean, you think about the seasons of life. The birthing of children, it's over now, God. And God says, no, guess what? That season's not over for you yet. I got one more for you coming. Please, no. But it happens, right? It happens. <laughs> How many times we walk through these moments, right? Just learn to cooperate with the inevitable. <laughs> And it's interesting because I was having a conversation with my oldest son the other day, and I just am so relishing these moments that we get to have. To see the wisdom that God is cultivating in his life as he spends time in the Word. But our conversation brought this thought to mind. He's been walking an unbelieving roommate through a difficult time. He's... he's dealing with alcoholism and so my son has decided to come alongside with him so he was sharing how he went to an AA meeting the other night with him and had some great observations about the process and everything but it brought to me to mind this this serenity prayer and most don't know where it comes from but it's used all over the world in various support groups but it was written by Reinhold Niebuhr and he is considered Time Magazine actually considered him one of the greatest theologians of America up there with Jonathan Edwards I mean, his impact in the 20th century is astounding. A reformed theologian, great mind. But he wrote this prayer in 1934, and it's used all over the world in different support groups. And it is this, O oh God, give us serenity to accept what cannot be changed. Courage to change what should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. There is great truth in this. It's interesting to me that there is a lot of biblical truth out there in our society and most people don't know it. And we have chances to point these things out to them, right? You do realize we have a Christian foundation in this land and it was built on biblical principles. But an amazing thought, is it not? We can't understand everything that God is doing, and Solomon is going to return to this idea again, but we understand this from chapter 3, verse 11, that God has made everything fit beautifully in its appropriate time, even the adversity. He has designed both the good, the straight, and the bad, the bent, or the crooked circumstances in life. This is under God's control. So he takes us to this final thought in verse 14. Adversity and prosperity are appointed by God. Both the good times and the bad times, they're purposeful. They happen for a reason. I mean, generically, we can just simply say this, that the good ones are to lead us towards enjoyment and joy, and the bad ones at least to understand that this world is subjected to futility and vanity. At least acknowledge that. If we don't understand all the other dynamics that we're supposed to learn in these adverse moments, at least understand this. We live in a fallen world. And this isn't the end of God's plan. The fluctuating seasons of our life, they depend on God, and we need to keep dependent on Him. It's to cultivate trust in Him. I mean, you can read all the books you want to read on how to deal with this and deal with that, but in the end, we still have to walk by faith, don't we? We want to make sense of everything. We want to have these formulas and how we face this and face that. And we want to sort of help understand for ourselves what the next day is going to bring. Well, if today was like this, and obviously tomorrow is going to be like this. And we think that we can plan for tomorrow, but we don't know what's going to come tomorrow. Not ultimately. And if things work out how we plan them on the calendar tomorrow, praise God. <laughs> And 
And I'm not looking forward to tomorrow. So I'm trusting the Lord in this. Wisdom helps give us perspective so that we aren't deterred when times are difficult. So we don't turn our back on God and walk in the opposite direction. But they also help us keep us from being arrogant in times when things are going well, right? How quick we pat ourselves on the back by the jobs that we do. Good job, good job. And how seldom then we stop to take the time to thank God for all the good things that come in life. Verse 14 is interesting. He has two uses of the word good. Literally it is this. In a good day, be in good. In other words, just when you have days that are good, enjoy that day. Delight in the goodness of that day. <laughs> Sometimes in our life, we're so planned for the terrible stuff, right? We don't even enjoy the good day. We're so busy, ready, prepared for the bad day we think is going to come around the corner. Just enjoy those moments. I'm learning this with the kids, and, and by God's grace, I'm learning it before they're all out of the house. But, you know, you're so bent on trying to just direct and, and shape and do all of this stuff that sometimes you forget to just delight in the moments that you have with your kids as parents. You have a tendency to see the bad things, right? And look at the bad things, right? There's so many good things that they do. Sometimes we forget to stop and just rejoice in those things and thank God for the work that He's doing in their lives, right? In spite of us. When you have good health, when there is happiness, enjoy that. It's a gift from God. Sometimes we feel guilty. I do. Sometimes I feel guilty when things are going well. Partly it's just because I know that I'm a sinner and I don't deserve it so. <laughs> but when I don't delight in those things, then I'm not acknowledging the God of those moments and therefore then I'm not giving Him glory. And thus then it's shame on me, isn't it? So build memories of those things. I can do that in my life and look back and there are monuments that I've built to God, right? Like crossing over the Jordan River into the Promised Land and built this monument to remind them of. I do this in my life and I've done that over the years of just certain times where I've seen God, right? And I just remind myself as the psalmist does. I go back and remember these moments in life and, and things that God has done and the way that He's shown His goodness to us. And know that He will do the same because He's always consistent with His character. But Solomon is going to turn to the day of adversity. This is the second time he commands us to consider or to see. In the day of adversity, see. Ra'a, ra'e. Days of adversity. We don't necessarily welcome them. A lot of times we're like Job's wife, Right? So you want to hang on to your integrity. Why don't you just curse God and die? And it wasn't that this wasn't a painful time for Job. Sackcloth and ashes. There was sorrow. But he acknowledged he was totally in control of all this. So Job responded to his wife, Should we receive what is good from God and not also receive what is evil? That which is adversity? Do they not both come from the hand of God? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He worshipped Him. He worshipped Him. In light of all that was happening in His life. It's a reminder for us. God provides these boundaries in which we are to respond and act wisely and to conduct ourselves in a way that He is glorified, but realize that He is in control of those seasons. So he says, verse 14, that God has made the one as well as the other so that no one can discover what the future holds. Just when we think we figured out the formula, Job's friends, right? Just when you think you got it all figured out and you can figure out how God's going to work next and you can respond to it and we'll cultivate this nice formula to handle all of these different things and then all of a sudden God changes the situation and out the window goes the formula. 
You can't box God in. I cannot box God in. I don't want to make God try to fit into my categories and paradigms. I need to fit into His. And here's the reality of these things in life. No matter how much experience we have as believers, right? No matter how many books we read, we still must walk by faith. So many times, right, with all the theological training and everything else, I just have to stop and say to myself, trust and obey, for there's no other way, right, to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your truth to us, and you are such an amazing God. You are so good to us. So abundantly gracious. Incomprehensibly so, Father. There's there's so many things about your gracious working in our lives that we just don't even understand. All that you've blessed us with in Christ and the eternal hope and reality of what awaits us. Father, you're so abundantly merciful to us in times that we falter. times that we fail and we sin. And yet when we cry out and we confess our sin to you, there is forgiveness. I'm so astounded by that. Father, there's so many things that we just don't understand. And in those moments, may we just cultivate that childlike trust that we just rest in you. That we rest in your sovereignty and in your wisdom. That you are all wise and all knowing. You see and know everything. May we remember in the difficult times of our lives that you're in control of those bad days as well as the good ones. That you know just how much we can take. May we remember that, Father, in these moments, it's just about refining, that your fire is never meant to consume us, just to refine us, just to remove that dross from our life, that sin, that earth-boundedness, that under-the-sun perspective. All of those thought patterns and paradigms, Father, that we need to get rid of, so that we can see life and the world around us the way that you see it, that we have a biblical worldview, that we have a divine worldview. Because other than that, Father, then we are out of touch with reality and we are out of touch with you. And we find ourselves groping so often. May we keep our eyes fixed on your work. May we seek to understand your will as far as we can understand it. But may we always just walk in trust. And may we always obey your word. 
Pray for your blessing upon all your people this day. And it's in your name we pray.